Well, happy Friday to everybody. This is Robert Phoenix broadcasting to you live from Austin, Texas. You are now listening to the Friday Forecast. A little bit of a different intro there. Decided to change it up a little bit today. I got to bring back the Philip K. Dick intro. I think that's, uh, that's imperative. So today we're going to listen to an interview I did with Emily Moyer on Monday night. I was pretty gassed when I did the interview. In fact, I was so gassed that I had forgotten that uh, Emily was actually on my show before. That's how tired I was. But Saturday Capricorn, there's a lot. I've, I've been working my ass off with this Saturn and Capricorn thing. I'm actually liking it. I'm, I'm liking it. So I've, I've decided that I was going to win. I was going to win my Saturn return. But there's no other option. Me versus Saturn. No, it's not that. No, I'm, I'm, I'm working with Saturn. Saturn's a teammate right now. Very important teammate. So, but it's been good. Changing my lifestyle. I'm actually going to bed early now. This is a big deal for me. I used to be a, a, just a complete night owl. I'd get to bed around 1.30, 2 in the morning. And that was that way since I was a kid. My parents did me a grave disservice. They let me have a TV in my bedroom when I was uh, like 13 years old. Oh, bad move. It's like the equivalent of giving a 10 year old a cell phone back then. And, they, they, and I had this really weird timer on my TV uh, so the, the TV plugged into this timer, and then you plugged the timer into the wall. That's how it worked. And it was, just, it, it was this big metal thing that looked like it was a, like a, like a clock, like a timer. You turned it, but it was metal. It almost looked like something on a bomb or a missile or something like that. This timer was like indestructible because the current would have to go through the timer. Right, and click it, turn it off. It was had to be solid state and all that. So they thought if I had a timer, that it would be fine. And they just turned the timer, like you know, it's like an egg timer. It turned it to like fifty five minutes, because that's as far as it would go. It'd be fifty five minutes, and then fall asleep, and the timer would go off and it'd be fine. But the timer would get to about ten minutes. I get up and I turn it to another fifty five minutes. It was not good. It was not good. But I did wa manage to watch a lot of episodes of The Tonight Show. And I became a huge Johnny Carson freak. This is, this is around the 8th grade. 13 years old. And, I, and then it was like, well, hey, uh, there's got to be something on after Carson. What's up next? Oh, The Tomorrow Show, Tom Snyder. Hey, I think I'll watch that. Oh, these guests are strange. They're stranger than The Tonight Show. I like this. And The Tonight Show had some pretty strange guests. If I mean, I'm dating myself here, but Johnny Carson used to have this guy named Rip Taylor on. And Rip Taylor was the most flamboyantly gay comic. You didn't know if it was a shtick or not. And he'd come on there and he'd like throw confetti and rose petals and I mean it was just crazy and Johnny loved him he loved him and there was this other comic who always pretended that he was drunk but he was never drunk so you had a guy maybe pretending he was gay another guy pretending he was dry, you know was, and every now and then the Tonight Show would have some weird stuff on there like I actually saw clips of Monty Python on the Tonight Show that's where it first got Introduced to Monty Python was on The Tonight Show. But then there was The Tomorrow Show. 
and I'll never forget when Tom Snyder interviewed these guys from, uh, two guys from Ekinkar. Ekinkar. It's all about astral traveling and leaving your body. I'm like, ooh, I like this. Now that's a religion I can sign up for. So that's where my, my oh, then I was like, well, what's on after uh, the Tomorrow Show? <laughs> At that point in time, not a whole lot else, except, except the Late Show brought to you by Jay Brown, Jay Brown Chrysler, Chrysler Plymouth Dodge in San Jose, California. Jay Brown, over the price slasher. Yeah, Jay Brown would play movies till dawn. Guess what? I saw a few of those movies. So the, the Night Owl thing has been around for a long time. I remember the first time I stayed up all night. I felt like I was high the next day. I was like, well, i got to do this more often. Anyway, I'm going to bed early now. I like it. You know why? Because I get up early. I get up early. And then I get to work. And today, just to give you an example, my workload, you said, I'm, I'm here to inspire you now. I'm inspiring by example. I got up today and I spent a lot of time working on this Michael Hutchins and Bob Geldof piece. And I've been warned not to print it because Bob Geldof's reach is tentacular. It's octopi-like. Uh, but I'm still going to put it up because at the end of the day, I'm kind of a small fish, to be honest with you. Although I did get an email from, not an email, but a, a message, a, a, a comment from uh, Mark Kloss, Polly Kloss's daughter, or father rather. Let's just say he wasn't too happy about my piece. Anyway, um... And then, so I did that. It's a lot of editing. Man, I found some stuff out. I found some stuff out. About the Live Aid material. A lot of that money went to this guy, Mengistu, who was a tyrant in Ethiopia. A lot of the Live Aid money went into killing people. Isn't that just the story of the West? God. It, you know... So what we're, well, here's, here's what happened with Live Aid. We're going to get to the Emily, Emily interview in a minute. Here's what happened to Live Aid. So there was, a, there was a civil war going on in Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia and apparently parts of Africa always go through periods of drought. And then they'll go through periods of, like, extreme water. I mean, think, think the Nile. Okay? Drought, 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 and then flood. Okay? So... It is cyclical and seasonal. What you don't want during a drought is a civil war. Because you can kind of get through the drought because you know the rains are going to come. But you put a civil war on top of it. And then Mengistu, who is using napalm that he got from the United States, and he's using the napalm to scorch the fields of the people that he found to be unfavorable and unpleasant. People that didn't like him and wanted him out of office because he was a cruel, sadistic tyrant. And so, hey, let's cut off their food supply. Let's use napalm and cut off their food supply. There you go. So now you've got a civil war going on. Now you've got the drought. And now you have the fields of beans and potatoes and whatever they're growing over there in Ethiopia. Uh, scorched, scorched earth. And then you're going to have hungry people. You're going to have emaciated people that look like they were, you know, occupants of Auschwitz or Dachau. And those are the images that the West saw. Those are the images that uh, Bob Geldof and Midgier, who's his buddy, both from uh, Ireland. I, 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 no, hold on a second. I think Midgier, Midgier is Irish. Yeah, he's Irish. I almost thought he was Scott. No, he's Irish. And um, so they decided to create that, that song. Let them know it's Christmas. It becomes a huge hit. 
and then they have the Live Aid concert and everything that goes along with it. They have a Live Aid trust. It's a trust. And they raised probably close to about $400 million, which in 1980s money is probably closer to a billion now. That's what I would think. And it was an interesting phenomenon, Live Aid, with all the concerts and um, this global event. It was like the first of its kind. It was actually kind of cool. And the music was great. I mean, Queen, David Bowie, I mean, everybody was there. U2. It was incredible. Bob Dylan. It, it, was, it was like uh, the fulfillment of the festival experience in the festival generation. And then they started to give some of the money to this Mengistu character. And Bob Geldof, of course, had a relationship with Mengistu. People kept telling him, watch out for him. Watch out for him. And now he kept, he, that's where the money went. Guess what he did? He bought guns, bullets, rockets. Which he turned against the people, the starving people that we were trying to help. Now, did all $400 million go to Mr. Mengistu and the war effort against his own people? Likely not. Likely not. The other kind of dirty little secret about Live Aid is that the money that didn't go to directly to Mengistu, which really helped the arms suppliers, was uh, basically used to pay off the debt that Ethiopia had. How about that? Ethiopia had racked up some debt. Well, it's going to the debt. So I went to the debt service, but that's just, it epitomizes, it epitomizes what we do in the West. And I think we're basically good people. You know, we saw, we saw a, a tragedy unfolding before our very eyes. I didn't even know where I was, when that, all that stuff was happening. I was, I was actually in uh, England at that time. And it was just before Christmas and the single was breaking. And I remember sitting on uh, the tour. I was on the tour in Glastonbury, meditating on world hunger. <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. It was one of the most magical moments, not the world hunger part. But meditating on the tour, that was, that was pretty darn cool, man, I have to say. Because you get up on the tour in Glastonbury, and, it, and that morning, there was fog in the valley, and you could see all these other kind of mounds, you know, sort of gently rising up over the fog. And you could actually see that the fog could be a sea, could be interpreted as a sea, might have been a sea at one time. And these little, these mounds, like, like islands, like isles, like Avalon, it was really interesting. Anyway, I meditated for a bit for world hunger that day, because I was... A, was a sensitive young man. But look what happened to me. The vicissitudes of age. The acid rain of cynicism. No, I'm, I'm, I still have my sensitive side. But it's gotten hardened. And now it's Saturday Capricorn. The birds are back. I've seen, I, you know, I do this broadcast from the, uh, the worldwide headquarters of Free Association Radio. 11th House Media. And uh, the, the birds are coming back. It's a nice sign. Yeah, so, but that's what happens to us in the West. We have great intentions. We see something and we, we want to help. I mean, look, look at what happened in Houston. My God, people left their homes in Louisiana to come help the people in Houston. People pitched in and sent J.J. Watt lots of money, and he's working hard to distribute, and he's no fool. He knows that that money needs to go to local people. He's not going to hand it over to the, to the Red Cross. I would say, by and large, we're, you know, we're decent people. We care. We care about others, and sometimes that care is used against us. Our care, our compassion, and our empathy is weaponized and turned against us. And that's where it gets real sticky. 
Because at some point we have to say no. We have to say no. It's not always the bleeding, the bleeding hearts club. But I think by and large we're a very empathic and very compassionate group of people. And then what happens? Then they take the money and then they <laughs> turn it into guns. And this, and, and this is how shitholes are created, by the way. This is how they are. They're created. In many cases, they start off with good intentions, and the next thing you know, it becomes all too human. And we're dealing with the vicissitudes of, you name it, grudges, anger, vendetta, power, just gets right down into that, that first chakra level. And then it all goes to hell. Anyway, uh, I was working on that this morning. And then I had an interview with uh, my, my dear friend, Heather Elin Longstreth, who I just know is Heather Elin. Great. She's, you've seen some videos that we've done in the past. And uh, she's such a, just a super bright young astrologer. And she was my, my, I have to say, She's the crowning achievement of uh, my students. I've had a few students. I've got a few now, but Heather is taking it all the way. She's taking it to the house. And she's actually doing really well and making a living out of being an astrologer and helping people. She's doing a great job. She found her calling. And, and the funny story was, I, you know, she, she moved, she was here in Austin and, um, uh, and I saw her on Facebook, and I was like, oh, this person lives in Austin. Well, maybe I'll friend them. <laughs> so I friended her, and she, and she said, you know what's really funny is that, you know, I really wanted to work, I wanted to become your Facebook friend, I wanted to work with you. I said, really? I said, yeah. I said, wow, well, let's, let's do it up, you know. So we did. She became my student, she, and, I, and I downloaded as much as I could to her. She's off and running, and doing some great stuff and uh, you know she's really pretty well versed on uh, uh, a lot of good stuff she, she does really good stuff good work with women really she's anyway she worked with anybody but so we did a video today we talked about Chiron and Aries and then I got out of that video and I worked with a student so this is you know this is my new day I've been up since uh, 5 a.m. and now I'm seven hours into my day and I'll have another client uh, later this afternoon. And we're done for today. That's Saturday Capricorn. It's the new discipline. It's the new discipline. All right. So why don't we talk about uh, Emily and what Emily and I talked about and where this is going to go and, you know, why, why it's important. Because... When I, when, you know, when I broke the piece with Larry Nasser and uh, what was going on with the USGA, the gymnastics, uh, the Olympic Committee, you know, I'm reading it from a certain perspective, and that is not my, it's not my world, it's not my wheelhouse, but, it, but, it, but it's Emily's world in a number of different ways because she was a competitive gymnast, and she knows gymnastics like I know football. So I thought, well, what better person to talk to and, and uh, dive into this with Emily? Not only that, but Emily has also gone through her own awakening process and dealing with her own trauma and her own programming. And she and she had a and she talks about it a little bit uh, on the interview where she had a bit of a breakdown. And if look, if you're gonna get free. Trust me, you're gonna have a bit of a breakdown, and it may not be Britney Spears like, but you know this is this is part of the disintegration and reintegration process. You take the red pill, and all of a sudden the world doesn't look the same. You think you just like walk into a new life? No, you don't. There are certain things that no longer work anymore, and the more attached or the more ingrained they are, the more that they're kind of stuck to some sort of, you know, psychic, 
program that you are really, <laughs> it's really not serving you, but still has its claws in you, it's difficult to look up some of this stuff. And uh, people malfunction during these periods. And what's important to understand is that the malfunction is okay. Right? It's okay. I mean, it's, because, you know, we want to, we want to label it. We want to get into the, uh, the, the, uh, the DSM and find some kind of definition which somehow somehow conforms to the malfunction and then treat it immediately. People need to malfunction every now and then. It's important. It's important. And then reintegrate whatever happens after the malfunction. Now, if you have a life that's malfunctioning constantly, well, that's a whole different story altogether. So anyway, I thought, well, let's get Emily on here. We'll talk about this. And she has some very uh, powerful things to say. And, um, you know, we get into not just kind of what happened with Nasser and but the notion of, of amateur athletics and, and um, how ultimately it's, it's just got to change. And I've been around it through uh, my son in baseball, and, and I haven't seen anything to the, to the uh, effect of what Nasser was doing with these, with these gals, young gals, uh, nothing like that. But I have seen overbearing parents and, and, stri and strident tones. And even myself, I've had to check myself a couple times. Because you know, I, not that I, it's, not, it's really funny. Like when you're a parent and you got a kid to play sports, it's a really great, great opportunity to practice some form of detachment, which is not always easy. Because for me, it's like I, I've seen my kid, it's like, hey, you know, I care about him and I don't, I don't want him to get messed over, right? I've got a Mars and cancer. So I become very protective of my kid. If I feel like somebody's giving him a raw deal, uh, then, uh, you know, Mars and cancer kicks in. But then there's also a part of me, it's like, you can do better than that. <laughs> you can do better. And that kicks in. <coughs> and at some point, we just have to, <coughs> we just have to back off. And that's where I am now. I backed off. Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. The future is on to see yeah, zada, zada. Man, I, was, I was getting to Charles Aznavour there for a moment uh, okay so let's get back into this piece now with Emily she is going to lead us down into the rabbit hole into the world of gymnastics, competitive gymnastics and programming so let's get right to it now this is uh, me and Emily from uh, from Monday night. It's about uh, about an hour and twenty minutes long. So we're gonna. This will take us right up to uh, almost two o'clock here out in the uh, Central Time Zone. I'll be back after the interview to wrap things up and uh, kick back, get yourself a a drink or a little snack, and listen on in as we deconstruct. Larry Nasser, the USGA. Oh, and one other thing before I start this. We talk about the Caroli Ranch. And Emily talks about it in the relationship between the Carolis and Larry Nasser. The Caroli Ranch has been shut down. It's been shut down for a month now. And uh, Greg Abbott, who's the governor of Texas, has now <clears throat> launched an investigation into the Carolis and Caroli Ranch. So this could get very interesting or even unfortunately, more interesting than it is because it's the type of interesting that, quite frankly, I think we're ready to get ready of. Get ready, we're ready to get rid of. All right, here we go. Emily Moyer. So it is my great pleasure to have Emily Moyer on my show. I don't think you've ever been on my show before. Yes, I have. I've been on your other show. We did oh, the, that's uh, right. your other occult show. tennis. Yeah. We talked about Serena. Yeah, that's correct. So this is the second time you've been on my show. Yes. Okay. My apologies. It was just it's been a long day, Emily. Um, 
So um, it's, back, it's great to have you back. And we're going to talk about gymnastics today. Yeah. And spe- specifically the Larry Nasser piece, which has just unfolded. Yeah. Uh, in, in a rather strange, surreal, tragic, controversial sort of way. And now there's this huge spillover to Michigan State University and the athletic department and culture at large at MSU. We'll talk about that. Um, And you bring a very unique perspective to all of this because you were a gymnast. You were a competitive gymnast. And this is a world that you know a lot about. So when this started to break and I started to talk about it on my show, I said, well, we got to have Emily on. Because not only are you uniquely poised to talk about it from your gymnastics perspective and the history of the sport, and knowing all the players, but we can go down a lot of dark rabbit holes with this and look at things like programming and MK Ultra and uh, you know, sort of the, a pizza gate kind of mm-hmm. and, and all that, and and also how this ties into social programs and and where this could all potentially lead. So um, let's get into this and let's just, let's tell people kind of your background of being a gymnast when it all started and how deep you got into the sport. And we'll go from there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for having me, Robert. Um, I actually was very glad that you asked me to do this because um, I was, you know, I've been, I've been talking about this, you know, over a year ago, we did a show about this when some of the story was first starting to come out. The reason it's gotten so much attention now is because the court case was just that last week. So we've done an episode. If you go back about a year ago on Off Planet Radio, we had an episode called, um, yeah, it was called USA Gymnastics and Pedo Gate. Um, and I've touched on some of the issues with gymnastics and a few other shows, a little bit in one I did with Sophia Smallstorm and a few other things um, over the past year. Um, but when this major part of the story started to really come out in the media last week, I was actually away on vacation and I was thinking about how I was going to start talking about this when I came back, um, and how, how I wanted to. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe I'll do something with Robert. And then I got home to find that you were looking for me because you wanted to talk about it. So I was very glad about that. Um, and thank you for this opportunity. And before I get started, I just want to say, so everyone knows that, um, I love gymnastics and this does not bring me any kind of pleasure to have to talk about this um, in this way, but I think it's really important. Um, and I, you know, um, there's three things in life other than people that I really love. And that's um, gymnastics, dance music, and this thing I do with you guys, you know, trying to sort of sort out what's going on here. And unfortunately I've had to uncover like dark, dark corners of each of these things. And I'm hoping that one day this kind of stuff stops, but um, just to let people know a little bit about my history with gymnastics, I started gymnastics when I was two years old. My parents put me in it because I'm um, surprised to everyone. I'm sure I had a lot of energy and I was driving them nuts. <laughs> um, it was a love affair immediately for me. And I did gymnastics um, from the time I was two till I was 20. Um, I started uh, training more seriously about the age of six and began competing before I was 10. And uh, in the club gymnastics portion of my life, I achieved level 10, which is the people that you see on TV in like the Olympics are um, elite gymnasts. And level 10 is the level before that. That was a, like a new level 10. I wasn't like a super great level 10, but a lot of the gymnasts you'd see if you watch college gymnastics and stuff like that come from level 10. As, there's a lot of elite gymnasts in college gymnastics as well, but um, level 10 is like the next level down. And I competed in gymnastics from like the age, I think my first meet was probably when I was nine or so. And I competed from nine until about 14 or 15 and then started some injuries and some time off and whatnot. But I returned, I always kind of kept coming back and then went on to do um, a year of NC2A division one gymnastics. That was a less than pleasant experience for me. Um, but it, what, I'm really glad I got to have that experience and um, compete with girls who had been in, world and Olympic competition, you know, I was a little bit, a little bit out of my league. I mean that, you know, like I, I was okay, but I, you know, it wasn't, um, I certainly wasn't a big fish in a little pond. I was certainly a little fish in that situation, which was a good, you know, a good experience to have. And then I, when that was over, I, um, I returned and I had been, I had begun coaching as a teenager a little bit, but I continued coaching gymnastics and I also did some stunt doubling in my early twenties um, and coached until I was about 25. 
and then decided to step away from gymnastics. Um, give people give people a sense of where this is uh, in, in time, 80s, 90s sure. world. Yeah, so I started gymnastics in 1977. And I um, did gymnastics in the Los Angeles area from 1977 until um, 2000, 1993 or 94. 1993, I went away to college. So that was the only, you know, so I did gymnastics at two gyms here locally in Los Angeles. And then I was on the gymnastics team at West Virginia University for a year. That didn't really work out for me. And um, I, so that was 1994. I came back. I was coaching and doing stunt doubling coached at various gyms in Los Angeles, Arizona, and Texas, and stopped, quit coaching in 1999. Right. And the reason that, that I quit coaching um, was because, you know, as a lot of us in the kind of work you and I do are, I was a different kind of person, and I didn't really fit in with the, the gymnastics world. I mean, I never really did with the culture you know it was a very particularly in texas where i was coaching at the time the very conservative right-wing republican my place just just down the street from where you live now yeah right down there at the you know sort of oak hill into that place very it's always packed very you know it's a big deal yeah so um you know i chose to step away not because i didn't i didn't like gymnastics anymore i loved gymnastics i loved coaching i had a great time with the girls but it was always uncomfortable for me with the parents and with the other coaches. Cause I just was not in any way other than gymnastically a part of that culture. And I okay. wanted to have an opportunity to explore other things I was interested in freely without having to feel like I was hiding myself from, you know, my job. <laughs> okay. Let's stop there for a second. So um, just to give people reference growing up, the gymnastics, idols, models, uh, yes. Nadia Komenich yes. and uh, Mary Lou Retton, roughly. So, yeah, when I was little, I was, like, really into gymnastics. Like, I was, like, the one who always wanted to, like, not only did I watch everything that was on TV, but I would, like, order gymnastics tapes in the mail, like, of videos of meets that you couldn't get on television and stuff like that. And so, like, Nadia Komenich was, I was a little young then, like, I was aware of her. But I started to become aware of, like, the famous gymnasts early in the 80s. And initially, some of my favorites were, like, Mary Lou Retton and Diane Durham. Diane Durham was also a Caroli gymnast. But she was, Mary Lou Retton came out of nowhere, like, 1983, won the Olympics, and then kind of disappeared, you know, after 1984. Yeah. Um, those two were some of my favorites. But I was always a person that liked some of the more unusual gymnasts. Um, and uh, I also started attending UCLA gymnastics meets, uh, which UCLA has a very interesting gymnastics team with the very stylish gymnastics team because of their coach, the choreographer, uh, Valerie Condos. And I was always really intrigued with people who were doing kind of weird stuff and unique, yeah. just like I am now with everything else. Right. Sure. And so some of my favorite gymnasts throughout the eighties were, I liked some of the Russian gymnasts. Um, there was one named Oksana Omelianchik that I really liked. I enjoyed um, the Romanian gymnast, Daniela Silvash. Um, later in the eighties, I was a fan of, uh, Phoebe Mills. I was a fan of throughout college gymnastics. I really liked a gymnast named Kim Hamilton, who was from UCLA, a gymnast named Tanya service, who is now also an NC2A coach. And then through the nineties, you know, I enjoyed, um, tips, you know, Shannon Miller and Kim Zameskel and Betty Aquino and some of those people, Carrie Strug was a favorite at periods of time. And at this point that was, it was where I was older than some of the gymnasts. So it was me appreciating right. them. Um, but after that point, I was really more into college gymnastics. And so the mostly names that people wouldn't super recognize. Yeah. I was now, trying to get a sense of who you're, you know, you would aspire yeah. to as a kid. At yeah. The time but, I, yeah. So I, I, I say probably Phoebe Mills. Like when I was in my super, like most into gymnastics phase, Phoebe Mills, who was on the 1988 Olympic team, um, w- was a favorite for me. Um, and then, you know, in the years since I stopped doing gymnastics, you know, some of my favorites that people would know now, I, I, of course, I like Ali Raisman. I like some of the uh, Russian gymnasts, Alia Mustafina. Um, I like, uh, I mean, I, I could go on and on, and I like them for different reasons that the listeners sure. might not appreciate. But um, I'm as big, so whoever listens to Off Planet Radio or has listened to things that you and I have done, like I'm a super nerd about gymnastics the same way I'm a super nerd about tennis and about dance music and all that kind of stuff. I know all, right. you know, yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to give kind of a historical context and, and the timeline and yeah. who, who you were following when you were young. And the other thing I wanted to talk with you about is the parents 
of gymnastics because they play a part of uh, a large part in the story, totally. in the Larry Nassar story, in the, in the gymnastics story. Yeah, and uh, you know, as you know, I've, I spent time doing baseball coaching, so mm-hmm. I know what it's like to be around parents who think their kids are alpha or you know a, yeah. a you know a plus athletes and the demands that they put on their kids, but also um, the relationships with the coaches. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I think you could probably find similarities across the board yeah. with pretty much every sport that's connected to youth, to our youth. Yeah. But I think gymnastics is it's kind of its own breed. It's in, super special. Yes. In its it, own I, way. So let's talk about the, gym, the gymnastics parents and your, your take on them, your relationship with them and, and ultimately, let's let's blow this thing up, and we'll bring it into the Larry Nasser present. Yeah. So gymnastics has really it's, it is its own unique thing in every way, and I'd say that you have there's like a few kinds of a few types of parents in gymnastics. Like there's the kind that are like the super what you're talking about the super overbearing parent that's just like there all the time and tries to be involved in everything and wants to talk to the coach about everything and thinks their kids are greatest and it's a little different in other sports because I'd say the, those parents are more like a combination of what you get from sports parents and what you get from like pageant mothers. So like uh-huh. John, like, you know, like it, it's usually, it's very seldom the dads every once in a while there is a dad. Um, but it's usually moms. They, it, the interesting thing, and you could probably even find if you go back and watch videos of some of the famous gymnasts, a lot of them are really overweight moms who are definitely living vicariously through their kid. I mean, they will sit there and watch their kid, train for five, six, seven hours a day, you know, in some cases be practically physical tor- physically tortured and they'll sit there eating their Big Mac and their French fries and whatever. So it's kind of unusual. So there's a few of those. And then there's like the more average parent that like can get like that sometimes, but isn't like that all the time and is sort of torn between wanting to be really involved an advocate for their kid in a certain way and wanting to pull back and let, let it be their kid's thing. And then there's the parents who totally stand back. And fortunately for me, my dad was one of those, but there is a danger in that, in that sometimes then they don't know a hundred percent what's going on in the gym. Right. Um, you know, so those are like the three main types. There's other special ones in between, but there's also a lot of parents getting involved with coaches and romantic relationships. There's a lot of um, sometimes parents lending money to coaches. Um, a lot of just weird line crossing stuff that, like in a single occasion doesn't seem that weird, but it can get weird. You know what I mean? Like it can get weird. It can get unusual. Um, and you know, it's like anything, like you want your kid to have the best experience. And so, you know, sometimes I'm sure in the back of parents' mind, if I do these favors for the coach, if I develop a special relationship with the coach, it'll benefit my kid. Sometimes that's true. And sometimes it's not. I mean, I've seen extreme cases of certain kids getting a lot of preferential treatment, um, you know, and then I've seen other cases where like you constantly see the parent like brown nosing to the coach and the, the coach doesn't care because the kid isn't really that good or the coach just doesn't care. Um, so there's a variety of personality types. Um, but you know, I, I do want to say this, um, you know, in some, I like, you know, I feel bad for the parents in some way because a lot of, and this certainly isn't all of them. I mean, my father was an intellectual and there are certainly some intellectuals whose kids do gymnastics, but there's also a lot of people whose parents, like they're simple people. Like a lot of them spend all their money to put their kid in gymnastics. They're not well-educated. You know, they're oftentimes fairly religious or conservative. I think it's, di- it's different now. There's a more of a variety. It's become a little bit more open-minded and liberal kind of people in the sport. And there always were some, but a lot of these people are people that like just don't know a lot about how the world really works. You mm-hmm. know, they're people that like either don't watch the news or just believe whatever the mainstream news is saying. Right. And also people who like are simple people who might like, you know, who wouldn't think to do some weird devious conspiratorial corrupt criminal thing. So they wouldn't suspect it. And one of the things that, um, you know, I have to say, and I think I said this back, maybe even the first time Randy ever interviewed me on his show, is um, gymnastics by its nature in a, in a certain way is an abusive sport just because it's so hard. And the amount of conditioning you have to do and the repetition, the repetition, even if you have the most appropriate, supportive, 
best kind of experience with a coach. The sport itself is somewhat abusive. And then you pile on top of that, you know, personality characteristics that make certain coaches abusive, even if it's physically or mentally or psychologically. And then there's this other thing. And to be quite honest, um, this has always been an issue. Like I, in some ways, like when people ask me like, well, did you know about this? How long have you known about this? In some ways I've known my whole life. And as a kid, I didn't have language for it and I wasn't quite sure what it was, but in every single gym I've ever been in as either training as a coach or just competing at someone else's gym, there's always at least one creepy dude who works there. And sometimes there's creepy chicks. And if a kid can inter- understand that internally, they might not be able to speak clearly about it. How the hell do the pa- where the hell are the parents and the other coaches, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and you don't want to get into this situation where you're judging people based on how they look. But you know what? This is your kid. Maybe sometimes even if it's better to be wrong and have your kid not be, you know, it doesn't mean go and make a big stink out of it or, you know, accuse them of anything that they haven't done. But if there's someone you're uncomfortable with, just take your kid away from that. You know what I mean? And, you know, some of these people have been around that are creepy. I mean, have been around in the gymnastics community for a really long time. And it's not just coaches. It's trainers. It's um, some of the photographers who take come to the gym and take pictures of kids like they do with baseball or who take pictures of kids at meets. Some of them, right. I have to say, I've met some that are very nice and I think are perfectly appropriate people, but some of those photographers are really weird. You know what yeah. I mean? Like older yeah. single men who really just like taking pictures of little girls and leotards. Like, like how is it that I could perceive that from like probably five or six that like there is some weird dudes. Uh, are the parents not perceiving it? They don't want to perceive it. They're overlooking it because they want their kid to be special. And sometimes that creepy one is the one who gives them attention. Yeah. You know, it's been, you know, so there's that. And then it gets you know, into a real gray area, right? And yeah. about, about who do you trust? Why do you trust them? Who can advance your kid? How much do you want to get involved? I mean, the other thing too, that strikes me, about gymnastics that I think sets it apart in some ways from other sports is that there is a real investment in keeping these girls as young as they can. And what I mean by that is that if they develop physically, like if they develop, if they um, get, uh, you know, um, more developed in the chest that throws off their center of gravity. I mean, there's, there's this concerted effort in some ways. Yeah keep these girls as petite and young and sort of almost frozen in amber for as long as they possibly can. And I think as a result of that, and I could be wrong, but along with that, there's a certain level of development emotionally and psychologically that may not Mm -hmm. also be advanced with these, with these young women and it's can you can you talk to that a little bit? What's done to these girls to keep them in the state where they're fourteen forever? Sure, so it's, actually, it's it's probably closer to twelve forever. I think twelve to thirteen is like the ideal, right? Um, there was actually a really good book written in the nineties by a woman named Joan Ryan called "Little Girls in Pretty Boxes" um, yeah. that detailed this on a certain surface level. Like we, uh, it's, it was kind of pre-conspiratorial era. You know what I mean? So it was more just like talking about like the eating disorders and the stage parents and things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, so for the most part, like you don't want to, um, you want to try and make it to the Olympics or to whatever your peak is going to be before your body changes. And then you want to freeze in time and stay there. And we've watched people who were really good and then they they gained weight the year or two before the Olympics or something and they didn't make it. Or even if they were still good gymnasts, uh, you know, the selection committee or Marta Curley didn't like their look. Um, people can research the stories of Christy Phillips and Kim Kelly for kind of some of this kind of uh, stuff. But you have a situation where, so girls are having their bodies, their weight, their diet monitored. They're not socializing. Some of them don't go to school. Some of them are homeschooled or go to a charter school that is at the gym, right? There are gym, like the gym in Oak Hill has a charter school at the gym. Um, so they're not being socialized in the same way other kids are. So, um, in some, well, in some ways, the way some of the gross things are happening at schools with teaching kids way too much about sex too early, you know, this wasn't happening back when I was coaching gymnastics and it was, these girls were not even learning anything about like how, what, 
proper interaction is what age appropriate action interaction is with boys and other people and, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, you know, and the other thing I want to address real quick while we're sort of talking about this part of it, you know, a lot of people will say that like, okay, some of the girls coming forward were in college. They were gymnasts at Michigan state university. When they said this happened, they're over 18. So it's still wrong that he did that, but that isn't really pedophilia. And I say, I beg to differ because there are a lot of girls in college whose bodies still look like they are 13 or 14. And so for right. a man to be attracted to that, it is virtually the same thing as pedophilia. Um, you know, the some of these girls are really, really, really muscular. And so they don't look as like, some are really skinny and some are really muscular. And the muscular ones don't look so prepubescent, but it's a different look. You know what I mean? And all of these yeah. girls, a lot of them don't have their, get, don't start their periods until they're, Late, very late in their teens or sometimes early in their 20s. Um, so let's talk about that. Why is that? Is, is it because of the training, the rigorous training, uh, the introduction of, you know, higher levels of testosterone based on that training? Um, why, why, why does this happen biologically to them? So I think, you know, it has, obviously it just has a lot to do with body fat, con- you know, body fat level. Uh, most gymnasts have under 10% body fat. And that's not normal. Most women have, you know, like 21 or 22 if they're thin and more than that if they're not. So right. there's that. There's obviously the restricted diet. There's the, uh, you know, and yeah, there's, I think, the, I think certain kinds of athletics build testosterone, but also a person with naturally high testosterone, a girl with a little bit higher testosterone, it's going to be easier for her to build muscle and to do some of these mm-hmm. things. Um, and if you look at someone like, if you look at someone like Allie Raceman, who's a beautiful girl, she's super muscular and I would not want to meet her in a back alley. And you have to, you can't even imagine the level of comfort Larry Nasser must have felt that he had this girl totally manipulated to try anything on her because she could kick his ass, but she didn't. Right. If you look at someone like her, she definitely has a naturally high testosterone level. Right. Um, and so that there's some of that. Um, and this is maybe a conversation for another time. And I've touched on it a little bit in the show. I did a Sophia small storm, but I also do believe that the same thing. Like I said, when we talked about tennis, there is a level of some of these girls have certain, you know, androgynous qualities, intersex qualities. Um, and they're, you know, yeah. And so, um, and I've even, you know, I've even tossed out the idea that some of them have had some level of genetic manipulation kind of stuff, but you know what, I, this is getting into a, a conversation maybe for later or, or another time. But yeah, we, we, we can, we can move that down the line. Yeah. What, I, what I wanted to follow up on, and again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to certainly not, not blame these girls or get yeah. into victim blame, but if they're perpetually kept in a state of around 12 or 13 mm-hmm. with their bodies, yes. through the training, whatever, then um, psychologically and emotionally, then it, it would mean that they're not that far behind in some ways. Well, I mean, it's, a, it's a little bit, okay, but here's the weird thing. There's, and this is, I think this is part of why they make a perfect victim on a certain level and also why the, they have such a really hard time adjusting to life after gymnastics. On yeah. one level, gymnasts, most gymnasts are very mature because they have to learn from a very young age to balance school and gymnastics. And and most of them are perfectionists. And so they develop a level of responsibility and a tidiness about their schoolwork. And you know what I mean? Like a, a, right. So there's a a certain maturity, but there's another thing where like, you know, the girls are gymnastics all the time. They're really busy. So they're not doing normal things like chores right? They're not like the parents are basically doing everything for them so that they like their whole life is kind of set up so that they can go to the gym and go to school and sleep. You know what I mean? Like they don't learn any, like I didn't learn how to do laundry until I went away to college and I had to, you know what I mean? I know how to make my bed until I went away to college. Like my parents did it or the housekeeper did it. You know what I mean? Um, and that's the same situation for a lot of these girls. Um, but there's also, there is a certain emotional maturity that develops from dealing with some of the, um, harshness, the, the harsh reality of what the high level competitive sports world has. Right. But it, but it, but it, it strikes me that there's almost a split and a bifurcation. It's, it's it, like, it, it, it's, it's a one compart- hand, compartmentalization it's yeah. to be highly competitive and, and push through pain, which is what sport is about. And, and to reach new levels of excellence and, and deal with the psychological stress and pressure of not just competing, but winning. Right. Yeah. 
And on the other hand, there's, they're being physically kind of torqued and manipulated to be around 12 years old. Yeah. And also, they have a very insulated environment where everything's well, taken care of. All their friends are girls, unless there happens yeah. to be a boys' gymnastics team in the same gym. So all their friends are girls. And because they don't have the same amount of time to do the little the kid stuff, like watch cartoons and play with toys, sometimes that phase goes on a little longer because they don't have as much time to do it in a concentrated way. And also because there's not the social life that involves boys that gets introduced at 12 or 13, like that, that's like where a major split starts to happen. Right. So, it, so the reason I'm bringing this up is because you know, we talk about MK Ultra and programming and from the individual level to the collective level, but that's a, on an individual level, people are taken out of their homes, given away by their parents. And there is a very concerted effort and program to split them. Mm-hmm. And then, and then do whatever they do with them from that point forward. Right. It almost feels like in gymnastics, you got that there is a natural program yeah. that is there to split these girls. Gymnastics is it like well, maybe not natural. That's not the right word. No, but it it, it, it appears natural. institutional it, program. Yeah, it, and it appears natural because you think, oh, because well, a kid likes gymnastics and they want to do this, but you know, it, like. MK Ultra has changed also over the years. There's a lot less of that take, taking kids out of their home and having their parents give them away, a lot more of finding ways. Like if you can get the kid to be doing something that they think they like, in some ways you have easier access to them and it's, it's, easier, it's easier to sell somebody on something that they like than on something that they feel that is obviously torturesome, right? It's yeah. easier to get them to buy into it on a certain level and same with the parents. Um, gymnastics is by its very nature the perfect vector for an MKUltra kind of program, I would go so far as to say that there are probably programs being run through some gyms and some universities. Um, whether the gyms and the universities even know that is the question. Um, right. For people who hear this that are gymnastics people that are listening to any of this kind of information for the first time, um, I urge you, uh, before you think anything we're saying is crazy, to research MKUltra research mind control programs project talent um when when you come across bump up against where it says well mk ultra officially ended in the 70s start researching the two three or four hundred sub projects under different names that are the same kind of thing and take a deep dive don't just read the debunking articles that'll come up first um but uh gymnastics is and i've talked about this it's almost like being in the military for kids right like the kind of conditioning we do is very similar to boot camp and the, the way that the girls are isolated is very similar to the military. They're around girls the way men in the military are just around other men. They're, you know, and in some cases where these girls are training at gyms away from their home, it's almost right. like being at a camp. You know what I mean? Well, they, uh, do that, they do that for boys in football, too. But there's a very different thing going on. With the boys, they want them to grow up as quickly as possible. Right. And, and assume the mannerisms and the characteristics of men on the field. Right. With the whole gymnastics thing, again, there's this torque with we're going to keep you young as long as we can. You, you'll menstruate in your late teens, early 20s, and we'll have all these things taken care of for you. And, yes, there is this initiation thing yep. going up. I, Not I, initiating I, to get older and be, you know, more womanly or, you know, it's like it's just be weird. Mature. Be mature. Very, be mature and have an adult frame of mind about a lot of things, but be very childlike in your appearance and be um, uh, like uh, very open to being manipulated and controlled, very obedient to authority, right? Gymnastics is very much about authority in very, exactly the same way the military and the church is about authority and the government, right? Okay, it's very much about the authority of the head coach, the authority of the judges, and in some cases, the authority of the doctors and trainers. Um, when you said something that made me think of something else real quick, but I lost it. Um, but, oh, the other thing I was going to say is what you said about how there's this weird bifurcation or this weird double thing where they're like very mature in some ways and very childlike. If you go and you really observe and listen to the stories of MK ultra survivors, it's satanic ritual abuse survivors, same thing. They'll have right. elements, certain things about them that are wise beyond their years and show tremendous discernment and tremendous experience. And then other areas where they're like a six year old. Yeah, so the same kind. Of, it, it is part of the splitting the compartment. You know whether or not there's an actual MK Ultra kind of program or not. Gymnastics is lo- and and all high level elite sports is a lot about mind control. 
It's yeah, about being I, able to control your own mind. And for the coaches, it's about controlling the mind of your athletes to get them to do what you want them to do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so this thing, the division of like the body and the mind, like we're talking about, is part of compartmentalization, which is really, really important if you're going to create ultimately a person who's able to have a split or to dissociate or to um, be able to go into a trance like state like someone like Michael Phelps does when he perform competes really important yeah yeah i think of even the uh, the example of somebody who plays major league baseball totally. and who, who's a pitcher and giving up a home run yeah and, and 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 i've you know and i've coached and i've coached my kid and on on some level it's like well if you think about that home run too much you're toast and you're going to be worthless totally. yeah and same in gymnastics. You have to get right yeah. back on the beam after you've fallen. If you continue right. to let it linger, you're going to fall three more times. That's right. It's, uh, so at one level, it's part of the game, and you have to figure out how to survive or else you cannot compete. Yeah. And on another level, it does create a certain sense of disassociation. Totally. I mean, and what, the other thing that I always find interesting about with baseball players, and this is actually similar to gymnastics, it's one of the – there's a few similarities between baseball and gymnastics. I'm a fan of both baseball to much less of a degree than gymnastics but um you know like when you go to your favorite professional baseball games they'll have their song they play before they go up to bat right the level to which music is used in programming is crazy if people really understood it and so it's you know there's this simple explanation where like yeah i like the song gets me jazzed up but a lot of it is also hypnotic programming to get them into a specific frequency wave in their head and you also hear baseball players talk about like um going black or what are they what's the term where like they're just like playing like i can't there's a term i, I heard them say it sometimes they just like where they're not even aware of what they're doing like it just kind of yeah. happens and they're like so and then with gymnastics you have gymnasts who have floor routines with music and they'll do this floor routine with the same music for at least a year but sometimes several years and so it's part of like you know the nice store on the outside is getting into character or whatever but it also can act as sort of uh, you know like a a trigger, a hypnotic trigger to put you into a certain right. state of mind. Yeah. Well, let's, let's bring this forward. Let's talk about Larry Nasser and what, what's happened here. If you look at his background, he, he uh, graduated with a degree in kinesiology, mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken. He actually went into private practice. Mm-hmm. And he started doing the uh, sports medicine on the side. Mm-hmm. And eventually got deeper and deeper and deeper into women's gymnastics. Mm-hmm. Came a, a part of, was it four Olympic teams? Is that right? Was it four Olympic uh, teams? He's been involved with gymnastics for 30 years. He was the national team doctor for at least 20 years. Right. Remember, he he's the one who carried Carrie Strug off of the mat when she broke her ankle on the vault that won the gold medal in the Olympics. So that was 1996. So yeah. it, he was around for a while before that. I. Uh, as a child, I read articles in gymnastics magazines that were authored by him about sports injuries, about taking care of your bodies in certain ways. He's been around in the gymnastics community for a really, really long time. So one of the things that I had read, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, was that the success of the American girls uh, was due to the fact that Nasser, in conjunction with the coaches of the American Olympic team, or teams was actually integrating sports medicine into training. And so there was this whole new kind of hybridization yeah. that was taking place. It was about not just recovery or treating an injury, but also using sports medicine to stay fit. Right. In conjun- Is that true? So yeah, on a certain level, I mean, it became a big trend, like in the eighties, like almost every gym would have like, sort of a doctor or a chiropractor or like a physical therapist that was sort of associated with the gym that would like come in and help design like um, certain kinds of exercises for strengthening certain parts of the body or to help prevent injury. Or if girls had an injury, they'd be sent to them to help recuperate them. Like it was a big thing. Every gym that I ever worked at or went to, there was something like that. Sometimes it was a person who was a parent of a gymnast there. Other times it was totally someone from the outside. Um, right. Some of them were very nice people. Others it was kind of seem like strange situations. Um, but, you know, <laughs> so yes, on a surface level, but also what was, was there something else he was doing? Like we know about um, 
MK Ultra doctors, right? So was he really offering another service besides just integrating sports medicine? Is he trained in some of these hypnotic mind control techniques? Um, and a lot of people who do sexual abuse on kids are also trained in some of those kinds of things. So right. was he performing a certain service for USA Gymnastics that was valuable enough that they were willing to overlook the other service he was performing? Right. right. So, so you're saying that there's a possibility that Larry Nasser might have been a handler at a high level. A high level handler or, or whether, you know, like whether that was the intention as he came in or whether it was just how that happened. But if you make yourself indispensable to people, if you, you know, if, if there's someone there who can fix all the problems you have physically and also seemingly like the way the girls described it, he was like a friend to them. So also treat them psychologically in a certain ways and make them able to, I mean, it is interesting. Like, you know, back in the eighties, the U S gymnastics was not good. They weren't good. Now there were, I mean, they were all right. So there was a few individual stars here and there, but you know, it really got revolutionized with the introduction of the Corollis and Nasser came along at a certain point with that. Um, you know, Nasser is from Michigan and had his main association with a gym up there called Getterts. It was it used to be called Getterts, and it was called Twice Stars or Twisters. Um, it's Twisters, but it was spelled Twice Stars. Um, and being and working at Michigan State, and um, but he was present at every single training camp from sometime in the '90s until just like a year ago. Yeah. Um, that would happen at Caroli Ranch or at the Olympic Training Center, different kinds of places. Traveled with them to every major international meet. Um, was with them at, you know, any kinds of, you know, get togethers and whatever. So, yeah, I mean, he certainly like it matches what we know as someone who could be a handler, you know what I mean? A handler or a programmer. Um, well, what's really interesting about Michigan, and I'm not sure if it's just a coincidence or not, but that's where Kathy O'Brien is from. Right. Yeah. She's from Michigan. And her, one of the first things that for people who don't know who Kathy O'Brien is, she was an MK Ultra sex slave for the elite. And she Politi- came political out. Elite, yeah. Political elite, that's right. And also entertainment, too. Yeah. And so she comes out of Michigan, and one of the, and according to her, one of the first people that she has contact with is the then governor of Michigan, a guy by the name of Guy Vanderjack. Uh-huh. So here, here we go. It's a mission again, mm-hmm. Michigan. Yeah. And, and of course, Madonna is from Michigan. Madonna is from Michigan. Um, uh, there's a lot of musicians from Michigan, from Detroit. Uh, there's a lot of act- people in the entertainment industry, period, from Detroit. A lot of athletes from Detroit. Um, yeah. we have a, a, I have a personal friend who I met who's a listener to the show who's from Michigan. And she's just, she's told me just the level, there's, she's just like, there's so much mind control in Michigan. You know what I mean? Like, there's just so, um, yeah, like it's very, there's a lot of, there is a lot of interesting things about that state. There's a lot of sports programs there. There's a lot of music stuff. Motown comes from there. Uh, techno music comes from there. Uh, right. A lot of these things that are perfect vectors for a level, level to for a level of control to enter, but also to be used, you know, to control a society, to control to entrain people to certain ideas and whatever comes yeah. from there. It's also. Um, the car industry you came from, you know, like the first, the, the American industrial revolution happened basically in Detroit. Um, right. there's actually, if you go to Hart Plaza in Detroit, which is where the Detroit electronic music festival is every year, there's this big thing that looks like a stargate or a portal. And yeah. there's a lot of people who say that that's what Detroit is. And that that's why it was so easy to pour wealth into it and to suck wealth out of it because it's like a vortex, right? There's a guy, right. I think his name, I haven't looked at this stuff in a really long time, but he has some videos about Detroit and about other cities too. There's other cities that have the same exact thing. Yeah, um, talking about. His name is Chad Stumpke, I think is his name, yeah, Chad Stumpke. Think, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah his, his, his stuff is pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, I should, I should, we should have them on the show sometime, but, uh, you know, so there's a lot of interesting things about Michigan for sure. Um, and he was busy at work there, you know, and, um, USA gymnastics is in Indiana. So just like not that far away. Right. So he was, it wasn't that difficult for him to be involved with them. Um, but he essentially was traveling all over the place, you know, but the, the majority of the, uh, people who are claiming to be abused by him, 
that are not, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of national team members, but a lot of them were just gymnasts from Twisters or from Michigan State University or even yeah. other sports that were in that area. He treated, there was like a volleyball player testifying. Um, and there, you know, I was kind of waiting to be like, there's got to be boys. And there was finally one girl who came out and said he did it to her brother too. Um, so it was the kind of different kind of thing with that. We'll go into that a little bit more when I do a show about this next week on, on off planet. Um, but you know, he, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know what's going on up there in Michigan. Um, there's just, it was just an interesting notice that these two yeah, sort of events. One, certainly we know Kathy O'Brien was programmed. Yeah. And then, and then there's the potential of this other version of programming going on. Um, so let's go back in time. I believe the first person who brings this up with, uh, with Nasser and trying to get some attention around this happens in 2000, right around 2000. So, like, yeah. So I think there from there's varying reports. There's reports as far like either some things that say 1997, some say 2000, some say 2004. But for yeah. like ease of dealing with this, let's say 15 years. Okay, for 15 years, there's been people reporting it to various, like you know, various. You know, to this, either mission to the college or to USA Gymnastics or to a police station or something, um, but it was always kind of either explained away or swept over under the rug or covered up or the person you know blame the victim kind of thing, all that kind of stuff. Um, and there, in fact, the one of the testimonies in the court was from the girl who who uh, originally complained about him in two thousand four. Um, you know, and finally all this years late, these years later, she's getting, you know, some justice for having been told she was crazy back then that it was just a medical treatment. Right. Um, right. but, uh, um, the, when this really started to progress was, um, in 2014, 15 period of time. Well, let's just look back, back a little bit about eight or 10 years ago. Um, there was some other exposure of some of this kind of stuff that, in 1984 Olympic coach Don Peters was banned from USA gymnastics for life because of some things like this. And a, cu- a, cu- a couple of other coaches in the LA area and some in other areas of the country were banned from USA gymnastics. They weren't necessarily arrested or charged with anything like that, but they did lose their ability to participate in any private clubs or any competition kind of things in the United States. But it was very, very hush hush. And it was kind of weird. Like when that happened about a year before that happened, um, I had come to my dad and, I had figured out because some of my own personal experiences and the research I was doing at the time that I had figured out this whole thing with um, that the way all systems really work now are through sexual blackmail, political pedophilia, homosexual blackmail, all that kind of stuff. Right. And I had come downstairs to my dad and said something about that. My dad, all the things I talk about conspiracy wise or any of this stuff, he just kind of rolls his eyes and is like, whatever. So I told him, I was like, you're going to see that like before everything is done, every institution that we have, that we hold dear in our hearts, whether it's sport, I think this is exactly what I said to him, whether it's sports, you know, entertainment, government, everything, everything is going to come crashing down because they're all run on the energy of little children and pedophilia. Yeah, and, that's, like, that's true. Just for clarification on the Nasser timeline. Yeah. First lawsuit uh, came came in in 1994. Okay. Okay. So cool. Jamie, Jamie Dancher. Well, no, didn't did it come in in 1994? No, or? Lawsuit. She says in that's 94. The first time, that, that that's the first time. That's the, did she complain? I know. I actually no, knew. It was not 94. 2016. She goes back. So it looks like the first time that uh, Nasser gets on the radar in kind of a big way is with Rachel. Dan Hollander. Yeah. Okay. Real quickly, real quickly. I'm going to get there. I just want to tie something together real fast. So I said that to my father and that's the only time he's ever called me back and said, can you explain? And I explained what I was talking about. And then quite literally, uh, not that long later, the, um, the Penn state thing happened. And I said, see this, this is going to happen in gymnastics and then it's going to happen in everything else. And a little bit later, the thing happened with Don Peters. And I had known about Don Peters for a long time because I used to have a gymnastics coach that had been an alternate on the 84 Olympic team who had trained with him. And she, not in exact words, but said some things about him that led me to believe that that was going on. So I always kind of knew that. And so 
from that point, I knew this was coming and I didn't know it was going to be Larry Nasser. Um, you know, I didn't know it was going to come out. I didn't know it was going to be like this, but that was when I really, I was almost waiting for something to happen. Um, Jamie Dancer, just, so, just for reference here, I actually used to work coach at a gym that, that the gym that Jamie Dancer trained at in here in Southern California. And, um, Jamie Dancer is a lovely person. She was also on the gymnastics team at UCLA. And this is a person, um, with, uh, who, who I would consider no, no kind of pushover, sort of an oppositional personality. Right. And, um, that this could happen to someone like her, t- there had to be some major manipulation. She was, she was one of those ones arguing with the coach all the time, getting sent to the corner all the time. You know what I mean? This is not an easy person to manipulate or control. So for that to be happening with her, it was, t- her, she was a bit, I didn't know her super well, but I would chat with her sometimes at the gym and whatever. Um, a lot of the girls are from Southern California who are part of these complaints. So from what I understand in 2014, like what happened was there had been some complaints about some other coaches. There's another coach named Marvin Sharp who coached two Olympians, Sam Peshik and Bridget Sloan. He was from the Indianapolis area. He had been arrested for something like this and ultimately committed suicide in jail. Indianapolis star, I think did an article about him and some other people. And when that start, when there started to be some coverage, Rachel Den Hollander felt like this was a time she'd be able to come forward and actually something might be done about it. And Rachel Den Hollander, um, uh, hats off to you. Um, she started to really compile a case and she's a lawyer. So she started to gather the kind of evidence she knew she'd need. And then the, the original complaint to USA gymnastics though, I think, so she went, I think she and some others had gone to the police at some point. The original complaint to USA Gymnastics came from Maggie Nichols, uh, who at that time was being referred to as Athlete A, and just in the last few weeks has come out and identified herself as Athlete A. Maggie Nichols right. is a beautiful gymnast. She's on the gymnastics team at University of Oklahoma. She was on the 2015 World Championship team and just missed the Olympic team. She'd had an injury, but I'm having to start to wonder whether her not being selected had anything to do with it. At this point, she had already basically blown the whistle, even though it was – you know, not known to the public. So she, what happened was her coach overheard her talking about the treatments with another gymnast and hats off to her coach at, at, um, I can't remember the name of the gym right now. It's in Minnesota. Her name is Sarah. I can't think of her last name. When I do the show next week on ours, I'll have the name full hats off to her because she was the first coach to go and complain. And she went to, um, Rhonda Fain, who was a vice president of women's gymnastics and told her and ran Rhonda Fain said she was going to tell Steve Penny and then really basically nothing happened. But Maggie Nichols and her coach were the first to ultimately come forward and were athlete A. And then from there, um, there started to be some others that were anonymous at first and have now come out. And amongst the first of those were Jamie Dancher, Jeanette Antolin, and Maddie Larson, all gymnasts from the Los Angeles area. Um, all gymnasts who, uh, you know, beautiful gymnasts who had had personal difficulties a lot in their life because of this. Uh, right. That really started the snowball. And I think what happened was all of these girls, or a lot of them, had really thought that this was medical treatment. And when they found out it was sexual abuse, then it's like, oh, well, he did it to me too. He did it to me too. He did it to me too. So, like, some of these girls are just starting to deal with the idea that it's sexual abuse. And some of this comes from what we talked about and that they were so inexperienced with anything re- regarding sex that, like, if a doc – and also so – uh, believing in authority that if a doctor says, this is what I need to do to you for you to be better. So you can, you know, practice and make the team and whatever. Like, okay. You know what I mean? Like it wouldn't, you know, they, they hadn't experienced anything sexually at that point. So they wouldn't know that it was anything like anything sexual. Right. For most of these girls. And it's very disturbing. Um, uh, yeah. So, I hope I didn't take you too far off the path there. But no, no, it's just that once, once the floodgates open here, it's fast and furious. It's fast yeah. and furious. I think this now it's up, you know, in a several hundred, there was like more like 150 statements in court last week. More people yeah. than that have, have, you know, made claims on a certain level. I think it probably in reality, if we're just talking about Nasser, it's probably in this several hundred. And if we're talking about the number of gymnasts in the United States, um, male and female that this has happened to it's in the thousands, maybe tens of thousands. There's something like this, not necessarily 
Dr. Larry Nasser's treatment, but um, molestation by a coach, a trainer, a parent, or, you know what I mean? Or whatever, you know, something like that that happened, you know, related to gymnastics. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, you can follow the timeline on uh, SB Nation. They've got a timeline. And then the uh, Indianapolis Star, which I believe yeah. was uh, kind of the uh, the tip of the spear they for this. They started this, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, clearly, I mean, this is a big deal. Some of the people involved, uh, particularly, um, who is it? Uh, Ali Raisman says that the USAG is 100% responsible yeah. for the abuse by NASA. Do you, do you agree with that statement? Okay. So this is like a really, so first and foremost, I think Larry Nasser is responsible for the abuse by Larry Nasser. Yeah. But um, sorry, there is just no way he could have been doing this to all of these people for this long and no one else noticed or suspected anything. So, yeah. Um, in some ways, I mean, he's obviously a sick person and a monster, but right. is the person who know, who knows or suspects something is going on and doesn't do anything? I think maybe they're a sicker kind of monster. Well, this is kind of echoes of Penn State. It's totally it's it, it's totally Penn State, and it's it, and it's 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 embedded in the culture and the bureaucracy, bureaucracy, and it's at USA Gymnastics, but it's also just the entire coaching culture the entire gymnastics culture in this country. I mean, the problem is, is that when you have a situation that, you know, what they did back in like the nineties was they turned the USA gymnastics into a semi centralized system, right? It used to just be totally decentralized where like all the gymnasts had private coaches and they would, when they had the Olympic trials and they or world championship trials, they would name like whoever generally the winner of those were, their coach would be named the coach of the team. And they'd train together for two weeks and go to the Olympics for the world championship. And that was the end of it. And then they saw that like Chinese and the Russians and the Romanians who were really top at that time did this thing where they had all the girls living together and training together at a centralized facility all the time. Now that's probably not going to go. It's a very, those are all communist countries, by the way, or they were at the time that wasn't going to go over here. So they developed this semi centralized system where several times a year they would get together for camps at the Caroli ranch. And mind you, the Carolis are from Romania. And so, you know, essentially for whatever time they were there, they were basically being subjected to the same kind of communist training camp that the, the Carolis were running in Romania. Right. We know that the communist uh, block and, and, the systems inside the communist bloc, what, you know, whether it was Romania or Bulgaria or Russia, they're really good at mind control. Really That's good at mind control, yeah. yeah. Really yeah. good at mind control. In those in those countries, the families are so poor that they'll basically sell their kid off to that because the kid will make enough money for them to actually be able to afford food for their family, right? Right. And here we don't have that problem, but here we have the lure of fame and celebrity and uh, like accomplishment and achievement that is, you know, what our society is all about. And so it kind of performs the same function as like the starving family, you know? Um, and the person, I mean, there, it, this, there's a lot of blame to go around and a lot of people are really, really they're you know responsible for this but to me the big scary monster the bigger scary monster in some ways than larry nasser is marta caroli bella caroli and marta caroli if you look back you know there's been articles and complaints about their quote-unquote abusive training methods since yeah. the 80s and you know one of the people who was very brave to speak out in the way she did very early on and a lot of people accused her of just being bitter because her career didn't and in an Olympic, with an Olympic gold, individual gold medal was Dominique Mochiano. And she, she's a pretty interesting person. I really like her. Uh, she was never a favorite gymnast of mine, but I liked her more as her, you know, as after her gymnastics career and the things she says and the kind of woman she is. And, um, she accused them of being physically and emotionally abusive and neglectful. You know, she was, they were her, her personal coach back when they were still doing personal coaching and, um, people, didn't pay as much attention to what she said as they should have. And so there's been, she never claimed sexual abuse, but um, she's been very supportive of all these girls who are coming forward now. And she deserves some credit for being willing to say some stuff that a lot of people weren't willing to say when they were in their heyday. Um, but, you know, Jamie Dancher complained about Corolla's abusive methods back at the 90, uh, at the uh, 2000 Olympics. She right. said she made it miserable for her. She didn't want to be there. She'd made the Olympic team, but she was miserable. 
you know, and a lot of the other coaches, maybe they have, they didn't like it, but they went along with it. All they had to do was not let their kids participate in those camps and the Carolis would have not been in power anymore, but they wanted success. Like literally we have this situation. Well, yeah. The it's trade off, the trade off that these, that these, yeah. They, parents are involved with. I mean, go back to Bobby Knight in Indiana. Yep. Bobby Knight was a completely abusive college basketball coach. Yep. And, uh, you know, when I thought to myself, well, if I had a kid, would I, would I want to play for Bob Knight? My answer was absolutely not. My yeah. kid's not going to play for that guy. But there are parents who believe that by getting their kid into Indiana, right. uh, they'll have a great chance of playing on a national championship team. Yeah. Um, and whether or not they actually play pro basketball, it's association with that team yep. will set that kid up for life professionally. Yeah. I mean, that, and the same goes with people who are associated with Caroli. Kids who were trained by Caroli had an air about them that the other kids on a certain level just didn't have, right? And, yes. um, you know, parents were willing to do whatever to get Carolis to pay attention to their kid. And the coaches of the other – I mean, think about this. There's coaches from – their own gyms who have their athlete who they train 90% of the time. And then they just take them to the camp and let Marta be the boss of everything, even though they've done all the work with them. Right. And they'll do whatever they have to do to kiss Bella and Marta's ass. Bella was kind of more out of the picture later, but I wonder if he really was right. And I also wonder if it was actually always really Marta Curley in charge, even when people thought it was Bella Curley. And this is going to sound so stupid to people who don't know what I'm talking about, but people who do know what I'm talking about. I don't think it's a mistake that her, her initials are MK. Right. Yeah, right. They love this weird they, people who do like, I, you know, I have to wonder, you know, they came here from Romania. They defected here uh, when they were over, traveling here for a gymnastics meet. They just left the team and stayed. Um, and within less than 10 years, they went from having like $7 when they got here to oh, having a gym in Houston and this enormous gymnastics ranch branch. that's kind of like a Neverland, but for like na- na- nature sports, like they have hunting and fishing, he has exotic animals out there. It's enormous. They went from having nothing to having all of that in less than 10 years. Um, maybe there's something else going on. Maybe yeah, they could help. Could be. The one difference between Nasser, at least at a surface level in Penn State, and Jerry Sandusky is that Jerry Sandusky, while he might have enjoyed in a perverse sort of way, right? Completely perverse, the, the actual, um, you know, connection with these with these poor young young guys he was he was not the end point of the experience right, right. it was his job to pass these young boys along to the the uh, second mile foundation right and so he was essentially a pimp for very right. wealthy alumni. and that came out and it got to the top of penn state although it didn't go certainly far enough obviously right. um now, the question comes to mind is, was Larry Nasser not just involved in the, the, this perverse alteration right. of the girls, but was he involved in a way where other people, like the alumni of Penn State, were involved in it? If so, at what level were they involved? If so, what level were they involved? And if that's the case, then why haven't, why haven't these young women – who've spoken out against Nasser and much of their credit, why haven't they named other names? I mean, is he just an isolated case and incident? Is, this, is he just a lone predatory wolf? Or do you think there's something bigger here going on? And, so um, I, I do think there's something bigger going on, but not in that same way. Like I think that okay. the problem of pedophilia and gymnastics is enormous. It isn't, he's not the only one. Um, and, I think they'd like to sweep this under the rug and make people think it's just him. But I think he, what's attached to him isn't, I don't think he or anyone around him was any kind of pimp selling gymnasts to other, I think this would have come out way sooner. I think that he basically is attached to USA Gymnastics, which is like uh, as corrupt as a microcosm of the macrocosm of our own government. Right? It's a bureaucracy uh-huh. that is completely corrupt on every level, inside out, every, uh, everywhere. Whether it, it, it's financial corruption, right, or if there's some other crime, criminal stuff going on. You know, I sometimes have wondered if there's doping going on. 
if there's alteration to athletes, if there's genetic testing, you know, kind of, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's possible. Um, right. also, like, what's going on with certain kinds of like sponsorship and funding and different kinds of things. Um, I don't know. I don't think there's like a sex ring being run through USA gymnastics. I don't think that, but I could be wrong. I don't know. We'll see. Like, you know what I mean? We'll see what I think that things are going to start to unwind. And I think one of the things that is happening here and that we have to be actually vigilant for and help these gymnasts and these parents, because a lot of these people are really naive and they don't understand how this actually works. So we have to let, not let them be, not let this be all put onto him and not let this, not that he isn't responsible for what he's done, but like, he's not the only one. We can't let it be, okay, we've killed the bad monster. We don't have a problem anymore. And we've gotten rid of the people on the board. And so it's fine. Um, we have to be careful to make sure that there's a cultural change that involves people not being so enamored with authority, just like in our problems that we have with our government, every single problem they have in USA gymnastics mirrors a problem we have in our own government, right? We have a political pedophilia problem that, you know, most people in the gymnastics world either would not ever be aware of, or maybe heard something about Pizzagate and thought it was debunked or something. Right. Um, right. We have bureau- bureaucratic crimes related to money and wanting to always win. And our government wants to be the most powerful in the world. And same with the USA gymnastics. They want to win every Olympics and every world championships. There's all sorts of financial crimes. We know that there's, you know, drug stuff. Our government does drug running. That if there's doping going on in gymnastics, it has all of the same features of this, of political, that political corruption has. Right. So yep. I think part of how maybe this happened was that he probably knew about some of the other stuff going on, especially if he's a doctor. If there was doping going on, he knew about it. If there was mind control going on, he was either participating in it or he knew about it, right? If there was any weird stuff like that going on, he also probably was aware of if there's some financial stuff going on or I don't even know. Like, you know, like hopefully there'll be some people that start to really dig into the inner workings of USA Gymnastics the same way. It just, I mean, Emily, it just seems to me like there is such a high degree of enabling with mm-hmm. the NASA yeah. case. At, at every step of the way, there's enabling, there's, there's, you know, sweeping it under the rug. And maybe it just is part of, like, what happens institutionally, like in Baylor. And okay. what happened at Baylor was you had basically a, a, a rape culture right. that was at Baylor through the students or the, the football team and the head coach, Barb Bryles, um, basically, uh, you know, the, the worst part, or it, it, it perhaps the most seemingly benign part, is he looked the other way. I mean, right. seemingly, it's not benign, looking right. the other way, not great. And, and, and then there's another sort of level where people accuse him of actually promoting a rape culture right. amongst the athletes there. Um, and yet, through so the it's school- like it's like the my hop and the lie hop, the my, the lie hop and the my hop of uh, of these things. Like it wasn't nine eleven. Like let it happen on purpose or made it happen on purpose, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. And so what happened was is that, interestingly enough, Ken Starr, who was the prosecutor for Bill for Bill Clinton, theoretically, back in the day when uh, the Clintons were part of a grand jury process. Uh, during during the uh, Clinton's run in the White House, Ken Starr was he was the president of, of Baylor. Well, and look at, look at what we've just said here. So the same thing that you're st- we're talking about with Nasser and all of this sweeping it under the rug and let, whatever. Same thing happened with the Clintons. Everything that they've done has been swept under the rug, covered up. Right. Same with Clintons and Podesta and all that kind of stuff. That's a great and point. That's just great like point. there's Ken Starr. Here we have Diane Feinstein, who's at who. And this is my, this is one of my biggest concerns. Diane Feinstein is sponsoring a bill and all uh, they had, some of the gymnasts have gone and testified in front of Congress. And she, some of them are, you know, actively involved with her trying to pass a bill that is like, says, okay, if a gymnast reports something, they have to report it to the FBI. The fact that Diane Feinstein is involved in this is like the Fox watching the hen house. Right. right. I mean, in, one of the testimonies Maddie Larson talked about Diane, Fein, you know, Diane Feinstein, and I don't fault her for this because I don't think she really understands who Diane Feinstein is and how corrupt to the bone she is and how she's done all the same kind of icky corrupt stuff that all these others that we've talked about have done. Like I see it as she's like sitting on top of this to make sure she 
You know, I think, I think there is a connection between the, the, you know, even if it's just symbolically between what's going on in USA Gymnastics and what's going on for government. I think in some ways the government and the media and why this has gotten the kind of attention it has in the media, they're running this like a test case to, because the political pedophilia thing is not going to be able to stay hidden for much longer. And they're using this as like a trial run to see, can we get away with blaming it all on one guy? Can we get away with just being like, oh, we're going to pass new laws, right? So these people are going to Diane Feinstein for help, which I don't fault them for because they don't know about this stuff. And Diane Feinstein is going to, you know, so now anything that happens with this, she'll be kind of aware of. And they're wondering why Paul Ryan hasn't, Maddie Larson was wondering why Paul Ryan hasn't brought it up for a vote in the House, Right. Well, the people in the House probably have more sexual blackmail stuff on them than the ones in the Senate do, right? I guess probably even like a dirtier playpen. So you have him not wanting to go there, right? Because you don't want people looking to that. And then her like sitting like the, you know, sitting on top of this bill with them where everybody thinks, okay, she's the one who's going to help us and the whole thing. And then this whole way that they're being, and sometimes from their own, like their own volition, they're, it's being clumped together with the Me Too movement. Me Too movement is a synthetic movement. It is like Me Too is there to sort of blur the lines between rape and like an harassment, like a cat calling when a woman walks by a construction site, right? And now right. I, I think there was one post where Simone Biles said she was coming out as part of the Me Too movement. I'm like, oh my God, don't do this. These girls are going to be used to legitimize Me Too. I'm sorry. Pedophilia and child molestation is not the same as having your butt grabbed in a bar or being mad because you slept with Harvey Weinstein thinking you were going to get a film role and then you didn't. It's not the same thing. It's right. just not. And, uh, right. you know, and the, I, blur, the blurring of those lines can be quite, quite dangerous. Yeah. My, you know, my, you know, they're not going to understand this now. And I know that some people are going to be mad at me and whatever for saying this, but stay away. Don't, the government is not going to help you with this. If we lived in a right, moral and just world or country, it would, but our government is more corrupt than USA gymnastics. And what this case has, this case has more in common with Pizzagate, Pedogate, political pedophilia than it does with any kind of me too thing. And people who think that's an actual, actually, that's a terrific point because if, if we sort of muddy the waters um, so to speak, that what happens is, is that this whole kind of realm of pedophilia and child trafficking and even sacrifice mm -hmm. kind of, you know, gets sort of pushed up yeah. into this realm of harassment. The same thing. And they're, they're blurring the lines. Harassment, harassment, which could be, hey, you know, you look really nice today. Yep. And you touch somebody's shoulder all of a sudden that's being pushed down to the level of, you know, yeah. pedophilia and, and, and blur, blur the lines levels of harassment. So it blurs these lines. And if you, yeah. if you look at this case, okay, like this is just what I've been thinking all along as this has been coming out. Larry Nasser is to USA gymnastics, what John Podesta is to the U S government, right? If this works to pin it all on Larry Nassar, then if they have to say, if they, right, they're kind of, he's kind of the sacrifice, even though he did all this abhorrent stuff and he deserves whatever he gets, right? It's a lot, it's like they'd be really happy if they could just pin it all on him, send him off to jail and sweep it under the rug, right? It may come to the point where like they do the same thing with John Podesta. Look at John Podesta and Larry Nassar even sort of look alike, right? And they're, kind of, yeah. they're creepy yeah. and disturbing in the same kind of way. And, you know, so if it, you know, if the political pedophilia starts to come out, I guarantee you they'll try and, you know, put it off on Tony and John Podesta and act like it's no one else kind of thing. But think about them. They're, they were never actually part of the government, right? They ran all these, they were like lobbyists and the advisors and ran like right. NGOs and all that kind of stuff. Same thing like Larry Nassar. He's not really a coach. He wasn't a gymnast. He performs this function as a doctor for them. And he also does this thing at Michigan State. It's like he has the same kind of like relationship to USA Gymnastics that Podestas have to the U.S. government. That's interesting. That's a really, really interesting parallel. So where do you think this is going to go? And um, how do we make any sense out of it and sort it out so that, you know, we have a place for it? We understand kind of the larger, the bigger picture yeah. here. So I think that um, 
first of all, we keep talking about it and we show nothing but um, support, love and respect for these girls and for their bravery and for what they've been through. Um, but we also don't let it just be controlled by the mainstream media and the powers that be. We need to keep pointing out and say, well, wait a second. What about all, where were the coaches? And I know there's been a lot of parents, particularly Maggie Nichols, mom, I have a lot of respect for her. You know, a lot of these parents are torturing themselves thinking it's their fault. And well, you know, that self-reflective process of asking themselves why they didn't see this is probably on a certain level, a healthy thing for them to go through. Um, we need to help them to understand that this is part of a cultural programming that like, you know, that they're on a certain level victims of this too. You know, the coaches, all these people, they need to do some self-reflection and ask themselves why they didn't notice. But also, but we ultimately have to be like, Hey, this is a bigger thing. We can't let this go on. We have to, this has to be controlled by the people, not by the bureaucracy of USA gymnastics or by yeah. our government. This yeah. whatever it is, we have to, it's it, in a loving and the best way we can keep reminding through our shows, through whatever that like, this is different than me too. And that the people who are bothered by this, they need to take a second look at what Pizzagate really is. It wasn't about Hillary Clinton running a sex ring out of a, the basement of a pizza parlor, right? That was tangential part of the information. It was about the code related to food and pizza that, that is a code that the FBI uses and recognizes, uses to recognize pedophilia that was found in the Podesta email leak that WikiLeaks put out. And that led right. to uncover, led to people investigating and finding that, you know, this wasn't obviously the first case of political pedophilia, but how massive this was. Look at political pedophilia. Look at the Jimmy Savile case in England. Look at Dennis Hastert, who used to be the Speaker of the House, and he was a pedophile. Look at the Franklin scandal. All of these are political pedophilia scandals that have happened in our own government. Go and look at this stuff. Go look at the story of Kathy um, of Kathy O'Brien. Research MK Ultra survivors. There's some out there that are telling stories that are a little not not not. Uh, on the level, but there's a lot of people out there that have heart wrenching stories that, in some ways, aren't very different than the stories of some of these girls who have been. Yeah, I, th I, th I think people need to be prepared. Be prepared. Um, if, they, if they go down that, if they go down that rabbit hole, be prepared because Kath, reading Kathy O'Brien's book is not easy sledding. I mean, yeah. it is really intense. Um, it's not for everyone. I could, yeah, I could it, I could take a lot, and I got three quarters of the way through it. I got enough. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and after like the fifteenth time, I read about her, you know, eight year old daughter being gang raped. Um, I, you know, I just couldn't take much more. Yeah, so it's not, it's not for it's not for every. I'm sorry, it's not for everybody, and that's why I said we have to help them with this because they not, may not be able to tolerate all of the details. But we have to find a way of um, developing a rapport with some of them so that we can help them navigate Absolutely. this territory. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and really, this, this, I mean, this is the rabbit hole. That's, this is the darkest, deepest rabbit hole. And when you go down it, it's, it is absolutely. It does, it's endless. It, it goes into the abyss. It, it, it's, it goes, goes right into the abyss and it goes into the realm of sacrifice and uh, it's deep, it's real deep. And then when you step back and you realize that this is the energy that is, that is literally powering this control grid, it blows your mind. Yeah. They were, you know, on, well, on a, on a certain level, obviously the world is run by money and war and all that kind of stuff. If you do any, if you research this and take a good hard look at it, you will find that, what really runs this world is the sexual energy of children. And it's right. disturbing. Um, I spent many years totally unfunctional when I discovered this. Um, and it's still like, you know, once you know, that, once you know this, you can't unknow it. It's not yeah. for nobody, but I'm hoping yeah. there's a few, a few who have an echo. Yeah. I'm hoping I'm that hoping there's a few brave gymnasts and a few and brave parents, parents out there, there who are willing to look. And um, we're certainly open to you as resources and anything we can do to help you understand that. I understand that a lot of the things we've said here might 
you might, you might not like, it might seem like almost offensive at first, but please try to understand it. I think. Yeah. And I, you know, look, I think this has been in the new sphere enough now yeah. since yeah. roughly 20, 2013. Right. We're on five years now. It's almost six years when, uh, when Jerry Sandusky's name started to pop. So people have had some degree of... What well, also the Catholic Church scandals. Yeah, the Catholic Church scandals as well. Initiation into this, this realm. And so it's not like they're just being thrown in a pot of boiling water. No, and, but and, at, the and, same, yeah. at the same time, we also run the risk of being inured to it because it also is in the the new cycle. So it's, but it's important to understand this. It's very important it's, to understand this because it is the power. It's it, the, is, it, it is the power that runs the control grid the, of the, this planet. The sooner it, that enough people, as soon as enough people understand this, it won't be able to work anymore. It won't be able and, to do this. Yes. Yeah. I'd agree. I'd agree. And the thing that is part of the power is not just this release of, the energy that is um, essentially feasted on, mm-hmm. but it is it is the power that keeps people in check yep. who are in positions of prominence. Totally, it's that it's it's political pedophilia is about sexual blackmail. It's about yep. basically um, also you can look at, up brownstoning. It's about basically catching people doing something naughty or with their pants down, and then blackmailing them into do things that they would never otherwise do. Why do you think that people who like seem like honest, great people who go into government? never keep any of their promises and end up becoming exactly opposite of the person that was running for office. This is why nobody wants the news to come out. You know, and sometimes it's not that everyone in government is a pedophile. Some of them have been drugged or tricked into things where they've just been aware that someone else was doing something, but there are some sickos who are really into it. Um, but, uh, you know, this is what our government runs on. This is what our society runs on. And the sooner that we can, when I say come to terms with it, I don't in any way mean become okay with it. But as soon as enough people are aware of this, it's not going to work anymore. And, you know, we need to stop, the, you know, people need to stop um, trusting authority or even believing in authority at this point, right? right? People need to be the authority of their own life and only give respect to people who have earned authority. If someone has shown you through their love, knowledge, and passion for something that they know what they're talking about and they've been able to help you, that should be a trust that's built over months and years and decades, not one that happens right away because they say this person is the boss and this person is in control of whether your kid makes the Olympic team or not. That is not earned authority. That is declared authority. It's the same thing our government runs on, and it's not good for it's not good for humanity. Uh, totally, totally agreed. Well, well put, Emily. That's because I wanted to just kind of you know round this up. And what is the spiritual lesson around all this? And, and I think the authority piece is really important to understand. And from my perspective, I think we also have to reexamine um, the role of youth sports. Yep. And, and what we're trying to get out of our children yep. uh, and, and, and as it relates back into our own lives. And, and this goes back to your authority piece that if we are advocating our authority on some level, then we're looking to our children mm-hmm. in some ways to fulfill that role where we've kind of advocated, even if it's projected out into their athletic prowess or what they can do. And, and I think we really have to re rethink our relationship with, with okay. you. In oh, sports culture in general, I think it's you know, that, important. That's a really good point. I mean, I remember when, and this is so weird that a chi- another child was able to see this, but when I was graduating from the sixth grade, um, we each had to like give a little talk about another person in our class. And the girl who was talking about me talked about her observation that I ran the household, right? That like, it seemed like I was the boss in some ways of the household, um, which isn't necessarily the case, but in a certain way, the, the whole household did resolve all around my gymnastic schedule and my life and whatever. And um, I probably, you know, probably it hasn't served me well in some ways in my life. It shouldn't have been that way. 
Um, you know, my, my father should have been a little bit more the boss, you know, my mother should have been a little bit more involved. And some of this stuff might be going on in the families of some of these gymnasts, right? Like, you know, you don't like the coach should not be making decisions for the gym, kid's life. The parents should be making decisions and the kid needs to be part of the family, not the, uh, the idol of the family. I, I completely concur. Well, this has been a really, uh, a stark and uh, revealing conversation about the gymnastics world. And yeah. obviously your connection with it gives it a, a great deal of validity and, we, and, and, and clarity. And we're, and we're still not completely 100% clear as to, you know, what's behind all of it. I mean, we have some, we have some insight and we have some background and there's certainly some clues that are pretty, yeah. pretty, we're, we're going to be uh, digging further and further into this over the next few weeks on Off Planet Radio. Um, I'm going to be having a few different guests come on who are um, well researched in other aspects of pedophilia um, and mind control. And um, if there's any, if you know, I would love to speak to some gymnasts. I know that that may not happen. You know, a year ago when I first started covering this, I reached out to the girl who uh, runs the only real, real good gymnastics podcast and didn't receive a response. And I understood, I knew it was controversial. Our show, we talk about a lot of crazy stuff. Um, but the things we talk about more and more people are people who used to think that I was nuts more and more are coming to me and saying, um, remember that thing you told me about, can you Please. tell me a little bit more? And so right. if there's any gymnasts, certainly any survivors out there who either want to share any stories with me privately or would in any way be willing to come on and speak on the show would be completely respectful. And, you know, you'd have, you know, editing authority on stuff, um, you know, or just other people involved in the gymnastics world who want to start talking about this. Um, I love gymnastics and um, I have made, I, some of those gymnasts who were speaking in court last week, some of them were some of my favorite gymnasts to watch. And this is heart, this is heartbreaking actually for the whole country. You know what I mean? Those yep. girls are, the stars every four years and um, you guys are heroes and you know, there's so much important work and help. There's so much that can come from this. So we need to really use this to holistically cleanse the gymnastics, not only the gymnastics community, but actually help to holistically cleanse our entire country because our country is sick the same way the gymnastics community is sick. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Robert. I really appreciate it. Hey, you're welcome, Emily. It uh, was great having you on and uh, looking forward to your show where you go a little bit deeper with this with Randy. So take care. And Emily Moyer, Off Planet Radio. There she is, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, guys. All right. Where are we here? Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Excuse me. So that was Emily Moyer and... Uh, Boy, did she have a lot to say, and if you wanted to get sort of a Matt side kind of commentary about the gymnastics, gymnastics culture and what's breaking here with, um, with this scandal, um, you're not going to get much closer unless you get right into the heart of that community, but even then, I don't think a lot of people could bring to the discussion Emily's understanding about trauma and mind control and all the other things that are, are kind of part and parcel of this. I was uh, listening, uh, actually I was listening in on my other computer, and I just saw that G. Edward Griffin now has a piece on this very same topic over on his website. So if you want to find out a little bit more uh, for another researcher's perspective, you can uh, check out his website, G. Edward Griffin. And we're going to continue to hear about this. One of the things that we didn't get into too much are the other programs up at Michigan State, including the basketball program and including the football program. And uh, Tom Izzo, who is a very popular, very successful coach at the uh, uh, Michigan State University, has kind of gone into a shell around all of this. And, you know, we have to, we have to ask ourselves, you know, what, what, what's causing that? Is it because he's really shocked at what's going on? Or 
is it a systemic abuse of power that's kind of allowed to happen at these American universities, whether it's for pro foot, I'm sorry, college football and Penn State and Baylor uh, with football and kind of a, a rape culture in Baylor, and also sort of the the ugly head that's being reared in uh, Michigan State with gymnastics. Jupiter and Scorpio, you know, this is the stuff's going to be coming out. It's it's a uh, it's expanding. So anyway, at the heart of all this are young women whose lives have been uh, altered seriously altered by the abuse of professionals, and probably some degree of enabling, whether it's conscious or unconscious, by parents and officials. And it's an old story. It's an old story. Uh, it's it's old wine in a new bottle, you know. Um, but I think the difference now is that uh, people are talking about it and and it ultimately comes down to some preservation of innocence. Some preservation of innocence that allows us to raise our children in an environment where they're not violated. And the violation isn't just happening with adults who are sick and twisted and you know completely screwed up in their own way. But there's other levels of, of violation as well. And those can happen through media and even the school system to some degree. So it's an interesting time and we're talking about it. And uh, let's see where it all goes after this. Well, again, Emily also pointed out the, the, the dark side or the downside or the side that is a part of manipulation where it gets thrust into kind of this me too category when it's its own separate category when it's a category that has to do completely with uh, child abuse and uh, molestation so anyway it's not the it's not it's not the most uh, inspiring topic to cover but it's there it's happening and when we have the opportunity to talk with somebody like Emily who knows both these worlds pretty pretty closely it's a it's actually a good thing to open that gate and uh, see what we can work through. Okay. Uh, anything else? Interesting quote by Trump. An interesting quote by Trump. I hope we can unite the country without having a major event. Very interesting. Very interesting. What do you think he meant by that? Like that could go a couple different ways. First of all, it could mean uh, a form of extortion, right? Like you people better get it together and figure it out and get on the same page and stop your bickering and fighting or else have another event. I mean, it could be like that. Or it could be to the people that actually stage the events that he knows that that's what they're doing. And, um, you know, we need to get it together for another, without another event. So there's this kind of acknowledgement that these events occur. It could go either way. It's, it's Sun, Uranus, and Gemini. Ah, oh boy. What times we live in, huh? And the memo. Has the memo been released yet? Has the memo been released? Release the memo. Release the Kraken. The memo is the all right, speaking of cracking, I'm going to crack my way on out of here. we got the Super Bowl coming up on Sunday. Eagles Patriots. It is the American Revolutionary Bowl. Philadelphia, Boston. Key places, right, in the history of this country. One is where it all began, and the other is where they signed off on it. Boston Harbor. And it was at Independence Hall, Philadelphia, right? Right there. For the second time, they faced each other before. And, uh, of course, the Eagles lost. Could be a very different outcome. Could be a very different outcome. I was on Clyde Lewis the other night. I said, okay, I think it's going to be a Eagles and an upset. And Nick Foles, the MVP. Although I woke up this morning and I was really feeling the Patriots. I was really feeling the Patriots. I was like, eee. <laughs> ah. 
I may have to go back in my prediction. But it's out there now. I can't, you know, you can't change that stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I've discovered the neti pot. It's actually been really good. I don't like sticking things up my nose. <clears throat> but um, it's working. All right, let's get on out of here. Out of here. Uh, have a great weekend. I'm not sure if I will be on um, on Sunday night. I thought I was going to be, um, but it is the Super Bowl, and um, I think it's starting at what 5:30, and it's. I know it's going to go for at least three and a half hours, so we're up to nine o'clock. So it looks like I'm going to be uh, probably not doing the Sunday night show. Yeah, I know, I know, it's the Super Bowl, whatever. But we'll start next weekend and. Uh, We'll do the 8 o'clock version of the live stream on Sunday night. That'll be the first Sunday night live stream at 8 o'clock Central Standard Time. So you folks on the East Coast will get it at 9. You folks in the Central at 8. Over there in the Mountain at 7. And on the West Coast, 6 p.m. You get the show at 6 p.m. You don't have to stay up too late to take it all in. And who knows, maybe we get a few more listeners, viewers. All right, that's it. You know the drill. Use your head to discern what's real. Your heart to step what's possible. Again, I want to thank Emily Moyer for being on the show today. Check out her and Randy Moggins on Off Planet Radio. They got a little Patreon thing going on there. You should check that out too. I'm Robert Phoenix. Have